Today's reading is Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 21. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam did, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if, by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Gracious God, we need your help. For we cannot truly understand your word without it. It is your spirit who works in us and through us and with us to bring deeper understanding of who you are and what you've done in and through your son, Jesus. And so I pray that your Holy Spirit will work to that end with everyone here this morning, that we may leave with a deeper knowledge of your love for us in Jesus. And I pray this in his name. Amen. Well, continuing our series in Romans. Uh, Paul's uh, magnum opus in a a lot of ways. Uh, This is one of the most comprehensive letters in all the New Testament. So let me uh, start by introducing you to uh, this family. This is the Huss family. Uh, The dad, his name's Rudolf. Uh, This is a German family uh, that lived through the war. World War II, that is. Uh, and I, I have learned a bit more about this, this family uh, in recent times. Uh, and there was an interview that was particularly interesting that, that was published uh, in a paper uh, with his daughter, Bridget, uh, back in 2021 when she was 88 years old. And she looks back fondly on her childhood in Germany. Uh, she remembers playing with her brother and horse riding with her sister and They had a small small swimming pool in the the place where they lived. Uh, She remembers how her mother had a love for the garden and and tended beautifully to the flowers. She had two tortoises for pets and two Dalmatians as well. And they lived through World War II. And she can remember the frequent uh, sound of air raid sirens and mum having to say, come on, let's go down to the air raid shelter. But she recounts how much her mum and dad loved each other. She looks back and comments how wonderful her dad was, a real family man. He was an absolutely wonderful person, she says. He was always hugging at night. He would give us a kiss and tell us, Schlaf schon Nacht, mein Kinder, which means sleep well, my children. A hardworking, loving father doing all he can for his family. Now, in April 1947, uh, Rudolf died. And his last words to his girls were, my dear good girls are specially uh, obligated to stand at your poor, unfortunate mother's side and with love assist her in every way you can. Surround her with all your childlike love from your heart and show her how much you love her. 
It's incredible. Now, for those who perhaps already know, and for those who don't, do you know who Rudolf Hoss was? He was the commandant of Auschwitz. That's what's in, in the background there that I've circled on the picture. That's Auschwitz. There's Hitler visiting the family. Right? He, he oversaw that death camp where 1.1 million people died, were murdered. And those words that I spoke just a moment ago were the words he spoke right before he was hanged in Auschwitz, having been found guilty at the Nuremberg trials. I mean, how do you explain that? World War II is this moment, defining moment in the history of humanity that we have struggled to comprehend ever since. How do you explain a child looking back with such affection at a man who obviously loved his family, probably mowed his lawn, looked after his wife, and then went to work killing Jews? How do you explain that? Why is the world a world where that can happen? Why are we the way we are? I mean, these questions have baffled philosophers through the centuries, but they've especially baffled philosophers since World War II. Well, God tells us. He tells us why, why World War II happened. He tells us why we're the way we are. He tells us in his word... That within every human heart, there is the potential for another Rudolf Huss. We don't like to hear that. We often look back on history and we like to think that we would be the hero of the story. The one who stood up to Hitler, didn't follow the orders. Maybe some of us would have. But many wouldn't have. As someone else who was well acquainted with just how evil humanity can be is Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was unjustly thrown into the Russian gulag. And arguably, the stuff that happened there was even worse than what happened in Auschwitz. In fact, far more people were killed in the gulags than in the Nazi death camps. And he says this, in his book, The Gulag Archipelago, he says, The line separating good and evil passes th not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart. And through all human hearts, the line shifts inside us. It oscillates with the years. And even with hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehead of good can be retained. No one is pure evil. Rudolf Huss is an example. I mean, even Hitler loved his wife and his dogs. Paul says it like this. No one is righteous. No, not one. We've been there. Remember chapter 3. For all who have sinned fall short of the glory of God. And then we come to chapter 5. Now... I know, that was a heavy start, Christian. But here's the thing. As I was reflecting on this, I was reminded that I don't preach to make you feel good. I preach to make you feel good about Jesus. And that's what my prayer is for today. Now, a surface reading of this passage can leave the best head spinning. It kind of reads like Paul has this big point to make, and in an effort to get it down, he's kind of vomited out a word salad. Right? Is Paul having a minor brain malfunction in this passage? No. 
Three reasons. We need to remember that our English Bibles are a translation and translating an ancient language into English, a modern language, is not as simple as A equals B. This is God's word. Full stop. His word spoken through Paul and he's taking us into some deep and mysterious theological waters, what has often been called original sin. And thirdly, it's actually encouraging to remember that even the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 3.16 talks about how Paul is sometimes difficult to understand. Now, if Peter said that, we're in good company. My approach today is going to be a little bit different to, to the way I've been working us through uh, these passages. I'm going to take us through the whole passage pretty much and then we'll get to a couple of points of what this really means for us at the end. Uh, I wanted to do this because it is uh, quite technical uh, and I looked for a way to avoid it as much as I can. Uh, so, <laughs> but I need to teach what the Bible teaches. Uh, and so if, uh, you know, if by the end, uh, my, my, my prayer is, and God willing, you'll have a clearer understanding that will lead your heart to sing about how good Jesus is. But if after the next 30 minutes, you're going to still be scratching your head a bit, focus on verse 20, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So... A tale of two Adams. Uh, the first part of chapter 5, Paul reached a crescendo of amazing gospel truths. This is last week's sermon, right? Unbreakable peace, unfathomable love, unfailing hope. Jesus has broken through any barrier to God we might conceive of and wonderfully demonstrated how the truth of our justification is that we have certain hope of life together with Jesus forever. This is off the charts good news. So Paul knows there might still be questions. But Paul, sin's power is still a force in my life. It's still a force in the world and, and death, it's, it's all around us. How could one person's sacrifice, as noble as it is, bring about the end of sin and death and the certainty of eternal hope that you speak of? Now there's a sense in which Paul is not going to answer all of that in this short passage. But as he goes on into 6 and 7 and 8. Well, says Paul, let me explain to you how Jesus' sacrifice was the focal point on which the history of the world turns. You think you understand how big a problem sin is? Think again. You think you understand the depth of God's grace in Jesus? Think again. And so he starts, verse 12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man. That's it's very clear who he's talking about. That's Adam. Remember him? Early chapters of Genesis 2 and 3. He was given a command to follow. He said, no, thanks God. Sin came into the world. God's good world. Now, some of you may be thinking, if you know the story reasonably well, if not, well, Maybe you haven't heard it for a while, I don't know. But you might be thinking, what about Eve? Wasn't she the one who gave in first? Isn't she the one who was really to blame? And it's very telling that Paul says nothing about her. Do you know why? Because she is not to blame. Who was the command given to? Adam, and where was Eve when the command was given? Nowhere. She hadn't been created yet. So whose responsibility was it to tell Eve of God's command? It was Adam's. Now, Adam's responsibility was also to keep, and the word there in Genesis 2 is a word that means to guard. It's the same word that is used of the angels at the end of Genesis 3 that God put in place to guard the tree of life. Did Adam fail in his duty to guard the garden by letting the serpent in in the first place? 
And where was Adam when the serpent was manipulating, deceiving and tempting Eve? Well, the text is clear. He was right there. Standing next to her, saying nothing. So how did sin really enter our world? Not through Eve, through the one man, Adam. And then what did sin open the door for? Death, we're told. That was the consequence God warned Adam of. If you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And so Paul continues, verse 12, And in this way death came to all people. In what way? Sorry, I'm meant to be bringing this up in front of you. How did death come to all people? How is it that all people receive the punishment for sin if Adam is the one who sinned? And we're told, because all sinned. Now, this is the point that I'm going to get technical. And after 13 years of preaching, I've tried to avoid doing something like this for a very long time because I don't want to overly uh, confuse you as best I can. But I couldn't avoid it. I'm sorry. So hopefully this will help. If you need to ask me some questions, I'm going to be right out there having a cup of coffee uh, once we're done. You see, English doesn't quite capture what's going on. Uh, and you'll see that from the context as well, by the way. Now, at face value, it sounds like Paul is simply saying people die because people do lots of sins. Right? But that is not what Paul is actually saying. When Paul says, because all sinned, that verb, sinned, is in a particular tense in ancient Greek called the aorist tense. Now, that's something we don't really have in English. And when we translate that tense normally in our English translations, we translate it with the simple past tense. Hence why it's sinned, that ed on the end. That's the simple past. But the aorist tense in Greek can be far more specific and often refers back to a single past tense action. Now the key word in that sentence was single. If Paul meant death came to all people because all people did lots of sinning in their own time and place, he would have used a different tense for that verb. So listen carefully. When Paul says that death came to all people because all sinned, he is saying that we are all guilty for one act of sin that took place in the past before we were all born. And that one act of sin is what Adam did in the garden. He says a bit later, verse 19, for justice through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners see Paul is not saying that all people die because we sin like Adam he is saying all people die because we sinned in Adam this is what is known as original sin Adam in some way acted as our representative the representative of all humanity such that his sin is also our sin. And because of this, because of sin's uh, guilt, stain and corruption, it just spread from that point forward. Now, my guess is some of you are sitting there going, hold on a second. How does that work? Well, these are deep, mysterious waters but Paul keeps building on this point verses 13 and 14 to be sure sin was in the world before the law was given but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law nevertheless death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as did Adam who was a pattern of the one to come 
Paul is pointing out that there was a big chunk of time between Adam and Moses where people were dying, but hold on a second, there was no law. So one might ask, how could they be held accountable for breaking a law they didn't yet know? Paul is not saying in this passage that all people between uh, Moses and Adam didn't sin. He, he is saying they did sin, but not in the sense of breaking God's revealed commands. Which is what Adam did. And the evidence for this is that from Adam to Moses, over those who did not sin by breaking a command in the way that Adam did, death still reigned. They still died. And the question is, why? And the answer is because they all sinned in Adam. Our representative. We bear the guilt, stain and corruption of that first sin. Now, if you're sitting there scratching your head thinking, I think Christian needs to see a doctor. That might very well be true in some senses, but not when it comes to this. What on earth is Christian talking about? It's because of our modern Western individualistic ears that we find such teaching strange at best, repugnant at worst. You see, in our culture, we swim in the deep waters of the individual is king. What matters most are my needs. As long as I'm not hurting anyone else, I'm free to do what I want, when I want. I can only be guilty for my actions and my actions alone. And there is some truth to that. But God's word takes a radically different view. One that ancient and non-Western cultures find far easier to understand. Cultures where the individual only finds and, uh, and understands their identity as a part of the whole, as a part of a family, a tribe, a clan. We in the West think more of ourselves like islands. Sure, we might sometimes form an archipelago, but we're still islands. Now, w there are still aspects of our culture where th this, uh, uh, this older idea of a not of the individual, but of being part of a whole, still echoes. Uh, parts of our culture that where that still echoes, where we understand that at some level we share a deeper connection. Think about this. Uh, we elect representatives to parliament. Now, when Australia, let's say Australia decided to go to war with New Zealand, who makes that decision? The government, our elected representatives. But at that point, when they declare war with New Zealand, we can say what? We are at war. Or when New South Wales will definitely beat Queensland this Wednesday, how many of us will share that news with people with, we won, even though you weren't even there? Or... On day one of the Paris Olympics, when Ariane Titmus wins gold in the women's 400 metre freestyle, which he is tipped to do, all of Australia will feel like, what? We won gold, even though none of us got wet. When King David swung his sling and killed Goliath, who lost? The Philistines did. Who won? Israel. Even though both armies did nothing but sit on the sidelines and watch. This is what's going on here. By being human, we are born in the first Adam. He is our representative head. And here is the good news. Verse 14. The first Adam was only a pattern. Not a copy of the second Adam to come. If the first Adam's disobedience is our disobedience, well, how good is it that the second Adam's obedience can become our obedience? 
Now, Paul goes on to explain how the second Adam is better than the first. But if the gift, whoop, but if the gift is not like the trespass, right, the first Adam's deed was a trespass, a conscious decision to rebel against God's command and think only of himself. The second Adam's deed was a gift, an act of obedient self-sacrifice because he was thinking of everyone else. Verses 15 to 17, For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by that grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Now, that's a lot, but let me summarize it for you. The first Adam, his disobedience results in condemnation and death. The second Adam's obedience results in justification and life. That's what Paul has just said. Right? As powerful as the impact of the first Adam, Adam's sin was the power of the second Adam's gift of grace is greater by far twice Paul makes that point when he says how much more right the second Adam's work can utterly and completely undo all the effects of the first Adam's sin and notice that Paul has said nothing explicit about the Jew-Gentile issue that he has previously talked about in Romans? Why is he do why is he not mentioned that yet? Because the only distinction that truly matters is not Jew or Gentile. It's which Adam are you in? Are you still in the first Adam? Or are you in Jesus through faith? Are you still under condemnation or have you been justified, declared righteous before God, forgiven, set free? This is what Paul is driving at in this passage. And there are two things for us to think about. And the first is, in Adam, you cannot escape sin. You can't. You are born under guilt. You are born with the stain. You are born with the corruption of sin. You cannot escape it. You see, you are not a sinner because you commit sin. You commit sin because you are a sinner. Because of corrupted nature. Sin corrupted everything, our relationship with God, with each other, and with creation itself. Such that from that moment forward, every child was born, that was born was born into a broken, corrupted world. And the human heart was not immune to that corruption. Rather, it's the source. Original sin, what the Bible teaches about it, is what makes sense of our world. It explains why there were the Rudolf Hosses of our world. Right? This is not just some novel idea that Paul came up with. Psalm 51.5, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Jeremiah 17.9, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Sin has corrupted everything. You cannot escape it. Adam is our first representative. He chose to rebel and we inherit, we inherit that guilt. Now, I think a, a, a way to think about it is a bit like this. If I borrowed a ridiculous amount of money to purchase a property, right, I am in debt to the bank. Ridiculous amount of debt that I really don't have any hope of repaying myself. Then I die. Long before that debt is paid. And that property goes to my wife and children. Guess what also goes with it? The debt. The debt is now theirs to pay. Something like that is going on with the fall. 
Instead of paying off the debt, though, my wife and children, they just keep adding to it. With outrageous spending, but you know, they've kind of followed in dad's footsteps and they're in debt for their own ridiculous borrowing. And in time, that debt will just get passed on. We're born into it. It's a state we are born into. It's a master you're enslaved to and it's a willful choice you make to disobey God but that you somehow can't avoid doing. You are born in sin. Many Christians, if asked, would say something like this though. When we are born, we are basically born good. We have the choice in front of us just as Adam did but at some point we follow his example and from that point on we are sinners. It's like we're we're born on this neutral ground and then at some age of accountability it's sometimes called we make a choice to sin and from that moment forward we are guilty now I understand why that's appealing but does it ring true if every human being has been given the same opportunity as Adam and we have in ourselves the ability to choose the good and not sin then surely through the, through the history of the world, there would have people who would have done just that. Never sinned. But there hasn't been, has there? Everyone, every single person born since the beginning has fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous, no, not one. And this is patently obvious from the moment we are born. It is. No child at the moment of their birth has ever thought to themselves, you know what, I am hungry, but I think I'll wait and give mum a rest. This whole birth thing has been pretty rough on her. Of course not. And I, I don't know about you, but I didn't teach my children to lie. And they learn that at a very young age. Four even. Popular view is that we might get dirty on the outside, but dig below the surface and we're basically good people. Bible says, no. You've got that upside down and back to front. At our core, we are sinful and evil. And we learn to cover that up. Right? We learn to cover up that stench with the soaps and perfumes of good deeds. We present as good, and sometimes the evil cracks through. And if you don't believe me still, then think about it like this. Think of all the thoughts that have gone through your mind, that have never made it to your hands or to your lips. And if people could see those thoughts... What would they think? Would they think, wow, they're more righteous than I realized? Or would they run away in disgust and horror? You're laughing because it's true. I know, know, right? I'm just like you. This is why the promise in the Old Testament fulfilled in the New Testament is that we are given a new heart. We need a new heart given to us by the Spirit of God. The gospel is not, you're not that bad. You just do some bad things. Try harder. You'll get there. No, the gospel is you're a sinner without hope who stands condemned under the sentence of death and hell. You need a savior. You need mercy. You need forgiveness. You need a new heart. And the only place you will find all of those things is in Jesus. Without the Bible's teaching on original sin, you won't go deep enough because sin is just a surface issue, not a heart issue. And you won't go far enough because you, you'll live like the solution to your sin problem is kind of within your power, within your reach. You think salvation is within your reach instead of realising you're powerless, ungodly and a sinner. Remember those things that Paul said about us? And we need a saviour who reaches out to us. The gospel has sometimes been pictured like you are treading water, uh, you know, with the threat of drowning out in the sea. And then, you know, along comes Jesus and he throws you a life jacket and calls you to come and swim over to the boat. That's not the gospel. 
The gospel is you are dead, you are drowned, you are at the bottom of the ocean. And the rescuer dives in, drags you to the shore, performs heart surgery on you and gives you new life. That's the gospel. It's Ephesians 2. Dead in sin, made alive in the second Adam. Sin's corruption runs so deep that it is like a black hole in your heart. You cannot escape unless God comes to the rescue. And this is the second thing. In Christ, you cannot escape grace. Why is Jesus Adam 2.0? Because he is God come as the perfect human being. To do for us what we were incapable of doing for ourselves, obeying God. He is Adam 2.0 and that is the upgrade of all upgrades. Romans 5, 18 to 19. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. We often focus on Jesus' uh, death on the cross, and that is extremely important. But his life was just as important for us. The fact that he lived a perfect, sinless life for you and me. That he succeeded at every moment where we fail at every moment. And this is wonderfully uh, pointed out for, to us in the Gospels uh, at, right at the beginning when Jesus is tempted by Satan. Just like the first Adam was. So in Luke you know, chapter 4 or, or Matthew chapter 4, you will find the temptation of Jesus. And, but it, what's really interesting is that you look at the contrasts as well as the similarities. And it just shows you how much better the upgrade is. Because in the first one, God said, don't eat from this tree. One tree. I've got all this stuff over here for you. Right? The whole world is yours. Just don't touch that tree. It's like, like having a table full of lollies and saying to a three-year-old, don't touch that smarty right on the corner over there. But that's what we do. We go for the smarty. <laughs> What about Jesus? He's in the wilderness. Is he surrounded by an abundant, generous uh, platter of fruit? No. He's in the wilderness. And he's fasted for 40 days. He's pretty hungry. And so Satan comes and says, If you're hungry, Jesus, why don't you turn those stones into bread? All right? God was abundantly generous in the garden, but here's Jesus in the wilderness, in a desolate place. Jesus is tempted on the very points at which Adam was tempted in the garden. Trust, worship, obedience. But where Adam failed, Adam 2.0 succeeds. Jesus is not superhuman, by the way. Don't fall into that trap. Jesus is humanity as she was meant to be uncorrupted by sin. You see, sin makes us subhuman. And the law was given to make us realize just how much that is true. How much we need Jesus to be our Adam 2.0 and obey God perfectly so that we could swap our filthy, sin stained robe for his robe of perfect righteousness. Romans 20 21 goes on, it says, The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And here is, you know, if a lot of what I've said this morning, you're still going, huh? This is the moment. Tune in right now. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. You see, the tale of two Adams is also a tale of two trees. The first Adam had a choice to obey God's will concerning a tree. 
and he chose not to. The second Adam also had a choice to obey God's will concerning another tree shaped like a cross. And that Adam chose to obey. Uh, Chad Bird, an a Old Testament scholar and um, a preacher, he says, Jesus did not for the joy set before him endure the cross only to abandon us when we stumble and fall from our sin. Uh-uh. He's all in, all for us, all the way. Where grace increased, uh, sorry, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. You cannot sin your way out of God's grace. You cannot outrun God's love. Once his love and grace have taken hold of you, you can try and pull away. And we often do, don't we? But you cannot break God's grip on you. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Not even the sin of Rudolf Hoss could have escaped God's grace if he put his trust in Jesus. You cannot escape your sin, but in Jesus you cannot escape God's grace. You may act like a five-year-old having a tantrum, but the Father in heaven is never going to let you go. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. When God created Adam, he knew what he was going to ha- he knew what was going to happen. It was his plan that the first Adam was always going to be the pattern of the one to come. Adam 2.0. You see, before light began to shine, God knew his love would be shown clearest in darkness as the light of the world was extinguished. Before a mountain was formed, God knew his love for you and me would find its way up a hill outside of Jerusalem. Before a tree had sprouted, God knew his love for you and me would be shaped into a wooden cross. Before rain had poured out on the earth, God knew his love for you and me would be poured out in blood. Before Adam breathed his first breath, God knew his love for you and me would be displayed as Jesus breathed his last now, this is a verse to preach to yourself every single day. Say it with me. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. And thank God for that. Let's pray. Gracious God, even the Apostle Peter recognized that Paul's words can sometimes be difficult to understand. But they are your words, nonetheless. And so I thank you for your spirit and the way he works to help us see the truth. And to see the wonderful truth of the gospel that where sin increased, grace increased all the more. There is nothing we can do once your love has taken hold to break free of that grip. Well, we thank you for Jesus, that he is our second Adam, and that when we are found in him, it's not death and condemnation that awaits us, it's justification and life, a certain hope of being with you forever, free from sin and death. And what a hope that is. Lord, we thank you. Thank you that where sin increased, your grace outstripped it and increased all the more. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.